Okay, so I'd like to follow up on earlier discussion about the idea of democratic peace. This is the idea that democracies do not fight wars with other democracies. This is something that's been observed empirically. We've, we've crunched the numbers and collected lots of data, and it turns out that this has never happened with some important caveats. But the reason for that and why we see that empirical pattern is really up for debate and discussion. I think it's worth maybe talking through some of the arguments that people make to try to make sense of, of what we see when we look sort of internationally and historically. Um, so I'll begin by simply saying that, that I've organized these into sort of internal mechanisms versus external mechanisms. Is it something about the democracies themselves, the way that they function and behave right internally that results in democratic peace? Or is it something external? Is it something about the nature of the international system or, or how they're interacting that's, that's driving this pattern. And so if I was going to make an, an um, internal argument, I would say, well, democracies have sort of transparent policy making that the process of, of, you know, creating foreign policy is something that occurs in sort of a public domain where leaders are going on television and making their case or they're writing letters to the editor or editorials in you know high profile newspapers that congressional hearings on foreign policy are covered on c-span that there's a lot of places where you can go to get information about what's happening in a foreign policy process and democracy what's being talked about what's being debated debated and so opponents of democracies um, have a pretty good sense of when democracies are seriously considering war. Um, they have a pretty good sense about what issues really require compromise and what are maybe more peripheral. Um, and all that tends to reduce uncertainty um, that, that knowing that your adversary, a democracy, is not going to just out of the blue attack you, that if there was going to be an attack, that there would be a period of sort of beating the drum and mobilizing politically um, your population to take that sort of an action. There might be a vote in Congress or in Parliament, um, that all of that sort of allows for the neighbors of democracies to sort of take a breath and step back and say, you know, we might not always get along, but I'm quite confident that an invasion is not sort of, you know, coming out of the blue. Um, a second argument that folks might make is that leaders in democracies are more accountable um, because they have to stand for elections on a regular basis or because they can you know, lose their coalition backing in parliament. Um, and as a result, leaders in democracies are very careful about what conflicts they initiate when they escalate crises into wars, um, because war is risky, because you don't really know exactly what's going to happen or how it's going to go you might think that you have the upper hand and you find that you're you know fighting a 20-year insurgency that you didn't plan on and for all those reasons leaders in democracies are going to be more hesitant to um to, to risk war and maybe that goes to the argument that democracies have a better um success rate in conflict than non-democracies i think that maybe that supports that finding um but i'm not entirely convinced um, that leaders of democracies are um, more accountable in terms of their calculations about um, the riskiness of war than leaders of authoritarian regimes. And, and the reason for that is that you know, uh, President Bush in, in 2003 you know, took the United States to war in Iraq, um, which was a war of choice. Um, the Bush administration opted to, to attack Iraq. It wasn't um, it was fully within their, their choice um, and knew that there was a potential that it would go very badly. Um, it did, in fact, turn out much worse than the, the Bush administration was, was hoping it would be. Um, President Bush uh, was able to win re-election. Um, he served out his full eight-year term. He wasn't impeached. Um, and then he retired and started painting and built a library and occasionally does public events, right? That disaster. Um, didn't have sort of you know drastically negative consequences other than tarnishing his legacy and you know um, perhaps making the American public less um, supportive of aggressive military action. Um, whereas if you're a dictator and you initiate a war and that war goes badly, there's a reasonably good chance you're going to be thrown from power. And when dictators are thrown from power, um, they tend to not survive. Um, they tend to be murdered by 
actions of the government or by the population. Um, so the idea that, that leaders in democracies are maybe more sensitive to risk is not something I necessarily buy, but I do think that in democracies, leaders sense that war is gonna be unsustainable unless they are able to secure um, broad public approval and, and support from different factions within that society. And maybe that leads to democracies being um, more cautious um, in, in, in their foreign policy. Um, other additional internal mechanisms. So some folks think that a lot of um, what drives democracies to be um, more peaceful with other democracies are um, institutional mechanisms like regular elections, um, rule of law, those kind of things. But that doesn't really help me to personally to explain why democracies don't turn on other democracies. It maybe explains why they're more judicious or careful um, in fighting wars. But the norms argument um, does seem to work pretty well to explain why democracies um, don't fight other democracies, but do fight authoritarian regimes. And the norms argument says that in order to typically rise to positions of high power in democracies, um, you're going to be socialized into the norms of democratic politics. And what that means is in democracies, when there are disputes, you work them out, you negotiate through them, you compromise with your adversaries, and that's the way you solve problems. In authoritarian regimes, um, you hold on to power by killing your adversaries. That's, that's how you hold power. And so a leader that has um, risen to power in an authoritarian system is gonna think about conflict and it's gonna think about compromise and it's gonna think about how to resolve disputes in a very different way than a leader that has been socialized by multiple decades and you know, city councils and state legislatures and Congress and you know, the, the bureaucracy um, to work through differences through compromise and conflict resolution. And what that means is that when democracies um, meet in the international arena and they have disagreements, those disagreements get resolved through the mechanisms that make sense to democratic leaders. They compromise, they work them out, they don't start killing each other. But when authoritarian leaders and democratic leaders meet in the international arena and they have disputes, the democratic leader moves into compromise and the authoritarian leader doesn't, in fact, maybe sees that compromise as a sign of weakness and that sort of strikes the democratic leader sort of in a front. That's not how these things work. What's wrong with you? You seem like a sociopath is sort of the, the thought process that gets played out. And so those conflicts between democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes, because they're not resolved according to the scripts that democracies sort of want to use of compromise and, and conflict resolution are much more likely to spark into war. And so I think that that maybe works pretty well um, and explaining um, what we actually observe in terms of the democratic peace pattern of democracies, not fighting other democracies, but being still quite war prone with, with authoritarian regimes. And then lastly, we could talk about maybe the role of public opinion or this idea that the public in democracies maybe is casualty averse, um, that publics don't like to bear the costs of war. I'm not sure that the data actually bears that out. It seems that when democracies fight wars, um, their populations, particularly for total wars, are very willing to make huge sacrifices and, and endure horrific costs. Um, but it certainly suggests that democracies are thinking about costs in how they conduct themselves in war. And so I think the idea that you know more money is spent on armor for vehicles um, by democracies and is spent by authoritarian regimes makes sense in that perspective that you're trying to minimize the pain suffered by your population because the population um, is important for understanding the state. Um, okay, we could talk about some external mechanisms. We could talk about um, sort of mutual perceptions of peacefulness. Um, this is sort of the, the idea that democracies bring with them this idea that democracies are good and authoritarian regimes are bad. And so again, when democracies meet in the world stage, they already have these sort of ideas in their head that I can work with you, you are a good state because you are also a democracy. And therefore, even there, though there might be deep disputes, you immediately start moving yourself into that negotiation framework, right? So even if a leader wasn't socialized into that, they're gonna bring with them that idea that democracies are good and move into conflict resolution. Whereas if you have the belief that your adversary is bad or evil or oppressive, um, as democracies might bring with them to the table when thinking about authoritarian regimes, 
well, that might affect how you deal with conflict with that actor. And so it, may, it might just be these these biases and, and, and um, senses of mutual threat perception that essentially resolve these disputes for democracies while escalating uh, disputes between democracies and authoritarian regimes. Um, and it's possible that this, this holds, that it's, it's these mutual perceptions of, I get you, you make sense, I see your system as legitimate or as, as um, understandable. Um, there's been some evidence that authoritarian regimes are less likely to fight other authoritarian regimes. I'm not particularly persuaded by that research, um, but there's also research that has shown that um, even before there were democracies in the way that we sort of think about democracies today, um, different political entities were aligning based on perceptions of likeness. And so in Italy, um, there were a number of independent city-states in like 1500, um, and those city-states would typically be either ruled as um, republics, right? The, they were ruled in the name of the people, or they were they were ruled in the name of a prince, right? So there was a monarch, um, and it seems that republican um, city states tended to be much more likely to um, to cooperate with each other and much less likely to fight than you saw with republican versus princely city states. And so again, it's a similar kind of mechanism. It's not necessarily the democracy piece; it's the mutual perception of of likeness or sameness that causes, I guess, the phrase is birds of a feather to flock together. Um, and then there's a whole nother possible story you could tell about this old democratic peace thing. And there's folks who don't dispute the pattern, who, have, who accept that the, the numbers are what they are, but don't really believe that democracies are different in their foreign policy. Um, and so these arguments typically come in, in, in three different stripes. So one of them is sort of the limits of the data, right? That long ago, there were very few democracies and war is a relatively rare thing. And so the fact that for you know 150 years, we didn't see democracies fighting each other is just a function of war and democracy were rare. It would be weird if we did see that. Um, and so maybe we just discount everything before 1945 as potential evidence for democratic peace. Um, a second argument kind of fits with that quite nicely. And that is that after 1945, there've been a lot more democracies but we also had a Cold War in which um, countries became democracies because they were set up as democracies by the United States, um, whereas the Soviet Union set up authoritarian uh, regimes in, in its sphere of influence. And then the United States sort of bound those democracies to itself in an alliance system. And so there's more democracies, but a huge chunk of them are sort of tied together in a way that makes war really unlikely. And so maybe it has nothing to do with democracy um, in the post-World War II era, and, and it has everything to do with this rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union and the kind of regimes that those, those two um, powerful states propagated. And that's possible. And so maybe it's only in the last you know, decade or two that we've actually really had a chance to test this idea of democratic peace in any sort of realistic way, and the numbers are still maybe not strong enough to have strong conclusions. Um, a third argument, I want to sort of separate this one out because this is this is genuinely a different argument and it's worth discussing. Um, this is the idea that democracies also tend to have more open economies than authoritarian regimes and certainly more open economies than um, communist regimes like the Soviet Union. Um, and that because of that, democracies trade with each other a lot. Their economies become intertwined and it might actually be the economic interdependence between democracies that's responsible for what we're calling democratic peace. Um, it might actually be a capitalist peace that's responsible for this. And there are a couple different strains of this. One of them is by a guy named Tom Friedman who writes a column for the New York Times. And in, in like 1999, Tom Friedman articulated this um, McDonald's theory of world peace in which he said that two countries that have reached a level of prosperity such that they can afford to have a McDonald's um, set up shop in their country, those countries will never fight wars with each other. And this is sort of a ridiculous thing to, to promulgate because Tom Friedman doesn't check his facts. Um, in 1999, when he, he sort of put this idea forward, there were literally two wars, including one that was like ongoing at that moment in which two countries with, with, with McDonald's were fighting each other. There was the India-Pakistan uh, uh, Kashmir conflict that I referenced um, 
in a previous discussion in 1999, and NATO had been bombing um, Belgrade in, in Serbia, um, which had a McDonald's. And so it's not necessarily just the countries are wealthy um, that makes them war averse. It's, it's more likely that trade piece. And there's been significant research that really has linked um, what we think of as democratic peace to trade ties and, and economic interdependence that sort of bound countries together much more so than the, the norms of goodness or mutual perceptions about how you should resolve disputes um, or any of the internal mechanisms that seem to be in play. And so, again, we, we know we have this phenomenon, um, but how we explain it remains really an open question and one that's kind of difficult to resolve given the limitations of the data that we have over the last couple hundred years.